In the case of uh, Iran, Holbrook is actually the moderate, believe it or not. And but but it's it still is, uh, these people are all these council and foreign relations, this APAC crowd, America Israel Public Affairs Committee, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, all these all these various think tanks that uh, uh, basically uh, are, uh, are are conducting. Um, uh, 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 the U.S. foreign policy is being conducted basically as a franchise to special interest groups. And I think that's uh, one of the things uh, uh, that uh, Obama is going to have to face uh, here with him getting tough uh, recently on Israeli settlements and, uh, um, and uh, Israel's policy against Iran. He told him he doesn't want them to attack uh, Iran and he wants them to halt the settlements, but... Uh, Netanyahu uh, is saying flat out no, and uh, it's resulting in probably the worst U.S.-Israeli relations since the Suez uh, invasion of 1956, when basically Eisenhower broke completely with the Israelis over uh, their invasion of Egypt. You think that's a real break because Obama was financed in large part by the Israeli lobby? You know, uh, and I look at Rahm Emanuel as his chief of staff and others, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I have to wonder uh, how far can he go with having these, I mean, Emmanuel during Desert Storm was serving in the Israeli army. I mean, when all of our guys, uh, men and women, were fighting, you know, over in Kuwait and uh, Saudi Arabia and in, in Iraq, uh, here we have Emmanuel uh, serving uh, uh, in another uh, country's armed forces. So how much leeway does Obama have? I, that, I, you know, I, I wish I had... Uh, my ear inside the uh, West Wing, but I do know that uh, Emmanuel is probably one of the strongest chiefs of staff in recent memory. And uh, and, and, and in one case, uh, uh, he was cracking his knuckles at this cabinet meeting, and Obama, Obama said, Rom, I find that annoying. I wish you'd stop. He gets up and cracks his knuckles right in Obama's ear, and everybody laughs. And I think that was Emmanuel's way to tell the visiting members of Congress and members of the cabinet, hey, I'm in charge here. And, and Wayne, Wayne, I have to say that everything with Obama is betrayal. He, you know, he'll say he's going to do the right thing, and he always goes back on it later or puts it into some debate process you know, while continuing with the older bad policy. So I think there's going to be a staged terror attack or something's going to happen so Obama can say, well, see, I tried to fix things, but now I've got to go in there. There's no way that the IDF Mossad agent... Uh, Manual and all that money he got from Israel. There's no way they're not going to continue. Uh, but but side issue. What are you hearing in Washington? Because I know you're right inside those intelligence meetings, uh, you know, covering them and uh, for the press. The word is is that Israel may go it alone and attack Iran. Would they do that without U.S. backing? Or where do you see it? Well, I don't think they uh, logistically could. Uh, they, they'd have to uh, fly over uh, first Jordanian airspace, but then they'd have to go over. Uh, Iraqi airspace, and we control Iraqi airspace, so it would have to be done with our connivance. Otherwise, they'd have to fly over Saudi uh, airspace. Now, they could potentially get that permission, because one of the little-known things about uh, the Middle East is that Saudi Arabia... Hate, hate the Iranians, yeah. Yeah, they, they're really on the same page when it comes to the Iranians, and, uh, and there has been a lot of low-level intelligence cooperation between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel on Iran, and also... Uh, with the situation with Hamas and and Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, it's 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 very little uh, known, but uh, it has been going on for a number of years. So, uh, but it, would they? You know, certainly, they may like to. The only the only way they could actually avoid the airspace and hit Iran would be to use their submarines, Israeli submarines, and they have uh, at least one, if not two, in the Persian Gulf at any given time with uh, uh, nuclear tipped uh, cruise missiles that could. That's hit, right. Those uh, German Iranian dolphins. Targets. Those German That's right. dolphins. That's right, but but they, but they can only pack a certain amount of uh, punch with those because uh, you know they're constrained to uh, submarine platforms. Uh, uh, so you know, would they would they uh, you know basically reap more than they would sow in a situation like that? Well, you know, Iran could be uh, expected to really retaliate in force. But we have Iranian presidential elections coming up th this week, and if the moderate wins, uh, that's going to take a lot of the wind out of. Uh, the sales of Netanyahu to, to, to be talking about a strike on Iran because everybody will be looking at further rapprochement. And, and if uh, Mossadi wins that election, I think we'll have a, a, an Iranian embassy reopening in Washington in probably six months. Okay, I want to go to some calls here as promised, but Wayne, I want to throw out two other points to you. I know you've got some intel on Air France. 
Was there any chicanery there? A lot of people have been saying that. There have been bomb threats in the days before. I want to get your take on that from your sources. But first, we remember that the CIA section chief over Afghanistan and Pakistan, and we interviewed him, wrote Jawbreaker and admitted what we already knew, that the Taliban would grab for $20,000, $25,000 bounties, 14-year-old kids that couldn't find the U.S. on a map, sell them as al-Qaeda fighters, and then they would take them to Guantanamo Bay, and the government didn't care. They wanted just bodies to say, look, there's the terror threat, you know, to, to add validity to the war on terror. Uh, now it's admitted that in Pakistan and Iraq, they pay people $150 per RFID chip, uh, or, or, or it's more than RFID, little radio beacons, and that the people admit, uh, this was in the Times of London and London Telegraph and in Wired magazine, that they then just go throw them in innocent people's houses. And that's some of why we see weddings and people being wiped out, because people will just leave these in public places and get their $150. And the Defense Department doesn't care, because they just want to say, oh, look, we identified all these terror targets to keep the mission going. It's kind of like fake body counts. But instead of having fake body counts, we'll just go ahead and blow up real weddings, and they're now using dead people at weddings as a body count and have reintroduced the body count. Your comments on that? Well, it's, it, it harkens back to, this, to this, what happened in Vietnam with uh, Operation Phoenix, uh, uh, inflated, uh, you know, number of uh, Viet Cong and VA dead. Uh, uh, it, it's, they're playing with numbers. Uh, you know, I really think we need to get out of uh, Iraq. We need to get out of Afghanistan uh, and, you know, stop this bloodletting on both sides. Uh, you know, General Petraeus, who I think is the biggest fraud ever, ever, you know, served in, uh, recently in the Pentagon, wearing a wearing a uniform, uh, is basically still pushing a surge, and now he wants the surge in Afghanistan, and the surge has had dramatic consequences. We've had all these, you know, the, the media doesn't even cover Baghdad anymore or Iraq more generally. That's right. The deaths got, uh, have gone back up now. Exactly, and and there, you know, you know, three servicemen here killed in a roadside bomb four here and and nobody's even covering it you don't even get covered because on obama's news. in now now it's a new chapter move on and then right, it's almost like on. iraq Real doesn't exist. Org supports the war that's the other thing this progressive organization now is supporting afghanistan and iraq the, the surge and uh, they've just shown themselves to be total phonies uh they're not progressive. They were uh, just in it, you know, in it for themselves. Another George Soros-backed organization, and Soros is the, you know, chief and most uh, wealthy uh, troublemaker in the world today. What about Soros? He's had all his organs attacking me lately. It's kind of scary. All his so, I joined the club. Me too. He's he's after me every day, and it comes from different. You know, he has all these fun organizations. So I'm getting it from, uh, you know, multiple sides. What does that mean <laughs> to have Soros attacking us? Well, I think it, it's good. I mean, it, it shows that we're not buying into his uh, Hegelian view of the world, where he he tries to create these opposition forces, and then he's going to capitalize on the chaos he creates. He puts these puppets in. He has these themed revolutions uh, in in Georgia, Ukraine. Uh, uh, he calls them orange revolutions, tulip revolutions, and Lebanon. But I mean, that's Peter. my point: is why yeah. is he bragging at press conferences? that he's behind the crisis, which he really isn't, but he's capitalizing, and saying, I'm having a great crisis, time of my life, culmination of my life. And then he's funding these eugenics movies, saying carbon footprints are big, we got to have global taxes paid to him. I mean...